Hi you guys, it's Dr. Baker Townsend and I want to talk to you about uh, reproduction and birth control. So you guys, um, Theolarchy, when a little girl starts to mature, um, she's going to go through several distinct phases um, before she's ovulatory. First, um, Theolarchy, um, which is the appearance of breast buds, that happens between the ages of 8 and 13 and a half years of age. Um, we see it frequently happening a little bit more um, quickly because of um, dietary changes um, that we have in America. So um, the, um, the greater the weight of a child, many times the earlier they're going to start their menses. Um, Andronarchy is the appearance of pubic hair. Um, it's followed, uh, it follows the larchy, obviously. Um, it's two to six months later after they achieve these breast buds. And then menarchy, obviously, is when they start um, their period, about two years from the first change. Menarchy happens between 18 and 16 years of age. Mean is 12.5 in North America. And again, it's probably related to um, body mass. Um, better becoming younger, um, it's, you know, we, the age of beginning of your menses keeps, continues to go down um, just because of um, our weight. Um, primary amenorrhea, um, this is the the child has never experienced menarche. Um, primary amenorrhea says um, there's no period by 14. Um, in the absence of secondary sex characteristics, which would include pubic hair, um, breast buds, um, and at that end uh, of that nature, um, no menstrual period by 16 years old, regardless if they have sex characteristics or not. So um, we worry about primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea is when you've had periods in the past and now you no longer have periods. So back to our awesome, I'm going to move my picture around here. Back to our awesome um, HPO axis. Um, so remember, the hypothalamus tells uh, the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin releasing hormones, and remember that's in this phase right around here. Okay, and then it releases gonadotropin releasing hormones, and that tells the pituitary to release um, follicle stimulating hormone, which is right here, and a luteinizing hormone, which is right here. Um, and then the ovaries then will secrete estrogen and progesterone. So the HPO axis is very important in this whole thing. If you have an alteration in the HPO axis, um, we know that that can um, cause you menstrual irregularities or menstrual problems. I just want to kind of look at these hormones one more time before we talk about contraception so that you can understand how they work. So you can see that obviously estradiol is the um, dominant hormone of the follicular phase. We see that estrogen has to go up in order to ovulate. Um, many times people that have too little estrogen or too much estrogen do not achieve ovulation um, either because they're so low they cannot get they cannot make that big rise in estrogen or they're so high they're too high um, and they just don't ovulate because the estrogen levels are so high. Um, so estrogen is the dominant hormone of the follicular phase. Um, and we know that progesterone is the dominant hormone of the luteal phase. And what we can see about progesterone is that um, what really causes, starts the vascular bed of the endometrium to really kick off is this rise in um, estrogen. Um, and then we can see this big gigantic rise in progesterone um, as it uh, helps the bed to mature. And remember, these um, phases of the endometrium are sloughing, um, proliferative, secretory, and then ischemic, right? Secretory, then ischemic. When it becomes ischemic here and it outgrows this vascular bed, then it begins to slough off and start this whole process over again. So if you were to get pregnant, we know that you would achieve pregnancy after ovulation right here, okay, after ovulation. And these two hormones, instead of going down, and when these hormones go down, that's what creates this ischemic phase, and this is what makes you have another period. When these two go down, of course, you're premenstrual right here because these hormones are going down. Um, what happens when you get pregnant, obviously, is these two hormones go straight up, 
these two hormones go straight up. When these hormones elevate estrogen and progesterone, you will not ovulate because your estrogen levels are higher. So that cuts off um, gonadotropin releasing hormone will still be in play, but uh, luteinizing hormone, uh, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone uh, will not be secreted from the pituitary if these two hormones go up, which is awesome. And that's how we're going to use uh, birth control. Um, and this just goes to talk about the same thing I've said. The hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin releasing hormone that stimulates the pituitary to secrete follicle stimulating hormone during the follicular phase to mature the follicle and luteinizing hormone during the luteal phase um, to make the bed of the uh, uterus um, suitable for a fertilized ovum. If the egg is fertilized, the purpose luteum and the ovary uh, secrete estrogen and progesterone. This stops the cycle. If it's not fertilized, we have negative feedback. The hormones go down and we will have sloughing of the endometrium and we will start the whole process over. So contraceptive counseling. So now we're going to talk about, we've talked about pregnancy and how, um, how everything works there. Now we're going to talk about how we use contraception and how it works um, regarding this cycle. So the first thing, let me move my picture around. The first thing you need to know, you guys, is that anybody who goes through, anyone that you see, it's your duty and obligation as a registered nurse uh, to provide contraceptive counseling. So contraceptive counseling, we have a mnemonic for that, and it's called braided. And that's just the benefits. What are the benefits of this contraception? Well, obviously the benefits are, it prevents pregnancy if it's used correctly. Um, but it has, has very, it has a limitation where it does not prevent you from getting a sexually transmitted disease risk. Um, there's some inherent risks with, um, estrogen and progesterone, um, types of, um, birth control. Uh, and so we want to talk about the risk, of course, IUDs as well. Alternatives. So if you don't like the birth control that you're on, you can go on a different birth control and we're fine with that. Inquiries, um, do you have any questions about this method? It's your decision. So decision is, it's not your mom's decision, it's not your husband's decision, it's your decision. So you decide if you want to be on birth control and which type you want to be on. Um, explanations, so explain everything to the patient, anything they need to know, um, and how the birth control works, and then documentation is D. So you really need to know braided um, as the registered nurse. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, let's see, um, condoms and barriers. So you guys, a barrier is just a way to prevent the sperm from getting to the egg. And of course, we always talk about condoms. Here's a condom. Um, and condoms are classic. It keeps the sperm localized to the male body and obviously prevents STD spread. Um, female condoms, this is a female condom. And this part portion goes towards your cervix, this portion right here. And this portion is outside of your labia. So it would kind of look like this. And this protects the woman um, from receiving sperm or any STDs. So um, female condoms are a very good uh, method of barrier protection as well. Um, we also have uh, diaphragms. And this is a diaphragm, okay? Um, you can see see how it's kind of U-shaped. And so what we do is we put um, ninoxanol or spermicide in here, and then it goes into the vagina, and it's kind of like a little trampoline. So the sperm jump in here, and then they that's blockaded, or there's a barrier, and they come out. But then there's spermicide on this side, so if somebody got by, um, it would kill them. So this is a teaching diaphragm. See how it has a hole in it? Diaphragms do not have holes in them. <laughs> so we tell people to check their diaphragm. Um, what's interesting about this is that um, all of these barrier methods are non-hormonal, so people like them. But with this one, you need to put the spermicide in, um, the, you know, the spermicide gel, and it needs to stay in place for six hours after intercourse so that um, any of the sperm that escaped um, could be terminated. 
So you that's the big thing about this is you need to leave it in and then make sure you take it out after six hours. Um, also with this one, um, if you've had a baby, um, the integrity of your vagina has changed a little bit and so you need to have it refitted. Um, also, if you lose weight, um, you need to have this refitted. So this is a diaphragm and you guys, these were very popular um, in the 70s and 80s um, because they were just a nice barrier method that didn't have um, estrogen and progesterone. Um, when estrogen and progesterone pills came out, they were really strong. And so people didn't really love them um, because they had a lot of side effects. Now our pills are much less and so people tolerate them better so we don't see as much use of um, the diaphragm. Um, another barrier would be a contraception sponge and um, this is just a sponge that goes in your vagina like this and this little string is in your vagina this goes towards your cervix and this has the Noxinol 9 in it and um, so it's a barrier plus it has um, it has the Noxinol 9 it has spermicide in it and these are one-time use you back to your diaphragm you just wash this um, after the event after you take it out six hours after the event you wash it and then you put it up and then of course you inspect it for holes and if you saw this big hole you'd be like whoa that's not working for me but um, you put it up and you can reuse it okay so that's some of our barrier methods um, natural family planning of course natural family planning is when we use our days our days of the month ah, sorry about that we use our days of the month and we we look at our fertile days so there's these little beads you can see these little beads and we can look at our days where we're fertile where we're infertile and we know not to have sex so we, we, we calculate out days of safe sex days of unsafe sex and these are called cycle beads and um, of course we don't want to have sex three days before or three days after we ovulate because we know the sperm can live for three days but on the, to be on the safe side we say five days so you're kind of wiping out ten days a month of sexual intercourse and based on your relationship and how often um, you guys have intercourse um, that can be a problem with natural family planning although you know cycle um, understanding and control is one of the best ways to know it's just that um, being disciplined enough not to engage during a time that you know that you're fertile so that can be one of the problems um, calendar rhythm method same De depend your fertile day you know look at your fertile days and avoid intercourse basal, basal body temp I'm going to back up to that picture again and remember our temperature goes up so you can take your um, take your temperature with a basal thermometer and when you see a spike in temperature you can avoid intercourse and you know people use basal body temp to get pregnant um, very many times they look and see when they're ovulating um, based on their basal body temperature because it only goes up one degree Celsius so you have to use a basal body thermometer and not just a regular thermometer another thing about this is you have to take it at the same time every day and before you get out of bed so um, many people who are trying to get pregnant put their basal body thermometer by their bedside they set their clock um, to get up at a specific time and take their temperature to, to know if they're ovulating but if you're trying to use it not to get pregnant you would kind of use it in the same fashion Um, so you guys cervical mucus ovulation test um, we're looking for cervical mucus which aids in the transport of sperm um, to the fallopian tubes and remember right here at ovulation um, we have a rise in temperature um, we have cervical mucus which is this thin mucus that comes from your cervix that allows sperm transport so we're looking for this um, for this mucus also remember at ovulation we have middle schmerz pain which is the um, actual egg coming off and coming out of the follicle um, and coming down 
uh, the fallopian tube. So you'll feel that middle smirch pain. So we, you can use it for determining if you need, if you know, pregnancy, like you want to get pregnant, you're looking for cervical mucus, or you could use it for prevention of pregnancy and um, you check for it and you know you want to avoid intercourse during that time. Um, some, uh, some pathothermal method is the cervical mucus in the basal body temp. We talked about um, barriers, female and male barriers. Diaphragm um, must be fitted, must wear it for six weeks. Um, cervical cap, this is kind of like a diaphragm but it fits over your cervix. Um, not very um, not very common any longer um, because they can cause irritation to the cervix. So now I'm going to talk about combination combination um, birth control. So you guys we know I'm going to go back to the chart one more time. So we know here I'm going to come off screen. I'm coming here a little bit. Um, we know right here, if you do not get pregnant, your hormones go down. We know this is when you have PMS, you feel terrible, um, swelling, fatigue, depression, um, weight retention. Um, we see these two hormones go down. But when you do get pregnant, these two hormones go up. So when we use um, estrogen and progesterone type birth control, what we're doing is we're actually, let me try to put a line in here, instead what we're going to do is make a line that goes like this, oops sorry about that, so we're going to go up, sorry, we're going to take a pill every day, okay, and you're going to start that pill. Let me just cut that one. Okay. So when these, so when I, when we say you're going to start your your um, hormonal birth control pills um, this Sunday after you start bleeding or you start your menses. So we know that these hormones are going to come down. You're going to start your menses, and then you're going to start taking your hormonal birth control pills, which have estrogen and progesterone in them. So there's going to be an elevation of estrogen and progesterone, the same thing that happened when you got pregnant. So that's going to prevent you from ovulating because as you're taking oral estrogen, which mimics pregnancy and stops the negative feedback. So when estrogen is high, you're not going to ovulate. Okay, when you're taking estrogen, you're not going to ovulate. And then of course progesterone, um, that will prevent um, rise of the, if you can see with the elevation of progesterone, you can see the endometrial bed, bed starts to thicken. So when we start you on estrogen and progesterone here, number one, the estrogen is elevated, you will not ovulate. Number two, you're taking pro progesterone. So you're not going to have this elevation and this thickening of your endometrial lining. And so this is why two things, people have less bleeding because they make less lining because their body already thinks they have one because of the falsely elevated progesterone that's in the pill. Um, and then of course you're not going to ovulate because your estrogen is already ovulated. So people will take their pills, take their pills, take their pills, and then we'll tell them we want seven days at the end of the 21 days for them to stop taking their pills. They're going to shed the lining that they built, but it's going to be very little because the progesterone was elevated and you didn't have this big spike which caused the building of the endometrial lining. So we really love estrogen and um, estrogen and combination estrogen and progesterone pills. Um, it's the most reliable, it's the most effective, but it comes in several different forms. Of course, you can have the pills, um, which, you know, you have to take every day at the same time. Um, it's really important to take them every day at the same time because they're very low dose. And if you don't take them every day at the same time, you can have a spontaneous ovulation. Um, if you miss one pill, you take it when you remember. If you miss two pills, you take two today and two tomorrow. If you miss three pills, you're probably going to have an ovulation. You have to back up and then um, start the whole thing over once you have a menses. Um, 
they come in pills, they come in a vaginal ring. This is a Nuva ring, and this you can see it's this little ring. It goes in your vagina, it has estrogen and progesterone. And what's interesting that people love this method, people really like this method um, because they don't have to take a pill. You put it in your vagina and you put it by your cervix and your pubic bone. This will stay in for three weeks and you have a constant low dosing of estrogen and progesterone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you don't have the big spikes when you take a pill. So, you know, we talk about in pharmacology, um, we talk about, um, uh, you know, when you're at, when the um, medication reaches its peak, um, we don't have peaks and troughs. Um, it doesn't go, it doesn't go up and down. It just goes solid lines straight across. So people have less side effects um, when you don't have a peak and trough um, with this medication. Um, so people like the vaginal ring. Um, patches, we also have patches. We can do an ortho ever a patch. And an ortho ever patch is awesome where it can, you can put it on your arm. Sorry, I'm trying to put it into view here for you. Um, you can put it on your arm or somewhere uh, where you don't sweat as much. In Florida, people don't really love these because we do a lot of outdoor activities and we perspire and we do things like that. Um, so the patch, while it can be very effective, um, it can cause us some problems because it comes off and then you put on a new one, then you have too much estrogen um, and progesterone and then it can cause bleeding and things like that. So um, we love all of these different methods um, with estrogen and progesterone because it is our most effective. Now, how it, we talked about how it works. It mimics pregnancy. It prevents negative feedback. But when estrogen ri levels rise in the body, and we've talked about this with pregnancy, um, it thickens your blood. Um, it thickens your blood because it's trying to hold on your placenta to your uterus anytime estrogen elevates. So you guys, there's some uh, absolute contraindications um, for um, estrogen and progesterone um, combination, um, and that's previous breast cancer um, because we know that giving you estrogen, if it's an estrogen-dependent tumor, can feed it. Um, previous blood clot, if you've had a blood clot in your past, um, we know that there could be a congenital or traumatic narrowing of some type of vessel. Um, and then if you've had a clot there, um, we know that you have the risk of having a clot again because you're having thickened blood. Liver disease, um, estrogen is excreted, um, uh, pills actually are excreted um, through the, the liver. And so if you have liver disease, we know we can have problems. If you have like super elevated cholesterol, some people are just really sensitive um, to estrogen and it can throw their cholesterol up. Um, so not just liver um, disease, but um, if you have unstable um, cholesterol levels. And then migraine headaches with auras. You can still have hormonal birth control pills um, if you have migraine headaches, but if you have an aura, um, it's not indicated because we know you have some type of vascular narrowing. So when someone goes on a combination of birth control, we do aches, which is the mnemonic, um, and we teach them this. Um, you need to know this for um, your final exam, for any teaching of anyone who um, is under your care as a registered nurse. Um, who is taking estrogen type pills. So aches is abdominal pain. Um, this could be a clot um, in the abdomen. Chest pain, obviously, um, it could be a pulmonary emboli. Um, that's the one we worry about the most. Um, headache, it could be signs of a stroke. Um, eye problems, um, they're having visual problems or severe leg pain, which obviously is a DVT. So you have to warn them about these um, when taking um, estrogen and progesterone. So progesterone only um, can, can come in pills. Um, they can come in Depo-Provera, which is this shot, which is this shot that lasts for 12 weeks or three months. Okay. Um, or it can come in the form of an intrauterine device. And you can see these are the strings on the intrauterine device. These usually wrap around the cervix and they cannot be felt by the partner. 
Um, and then this, this little tiny device is, you can't, all you can see when you're looking at a cervix is you can see the strings coming out. Um, but in a side view, this is what it would look like. Um, and you see the two arms of the IUD and then down. And um, Morena uh, and Skyla are examples of um, progesterone embedded IUDs. Um, we love those. They, they inhibit ovulation um, if it's in a high level, especially Depo-Provera. Um, sometimes these levels drop and you might ovulate. So, so, so it doesn't, you know, a progesterone only does not completely prevent you from ovulating. It inhibits ovulation, and a lot of times it work, works when the levels are high, but you can still ovulate. This is why if someone has a history of a um, ovarian cyst, we don't really love to use these because estrogen and progesterone will prevent ovulation and prevent cyst formation. So um, Depo, um, Depo, um, Morena, all of these, they thicken and decrease cervical mucus. So the transport vehicle is altered um, and the sperm cannot get to the uh, fallopian tubes. Thicken, thins the endometrium so there's no suitable bed um, if there was a fertilized ovum. Alters cilia um, and decreased tr sperm transport. So very it works very effectively. We can use it for anybody who's not a candidate for estrogen. Um, very safe, and they may have minor mood alterations, um, progesterone, um, decrease in progesterone, um, or increase uh, major in progesterone. It can cause minor mood alterations and two to three pounds of weight gain, which is usually comes off within time. Um, the IUD, and we, we kind of touched on the IUD that has the, um, we kind of, I'm trying to put myself up here. Here we go. Um, we touched on the IUD that has progesterone in it. Okay, so an IUD can have progesterone or it may not have any hormones. So um, a copper T is a, um, is a copper, is a copper IUD, um, intrauterine device. Um, that goes in that secretes no hormones. The copper is released up to 10 years, and people love their copper teas um, because they last for so long and there's no hormones. Um, it damages the sperm, thickens and alters the cervical mucus, and decreases the endometrial maturation. Um, the only problem is, is that we warn people if they have, um, I mean, they can cramp a little bit more and have a little bit of a heavier period. So um, if they have really light periods and they don't have a lot of cramping, um, this may be a great non-hormonal method for them. Um, then, of course, we talked about progesterone, morena, it thickens the cervical mucus, decreases endometrial lining. But, um, and you might have a little bit of um, progesterone side effects. But anyone who has an IUD, you need to really um, use the mnemonic pains. Um, because we worry, you know, did they get pregnant? Was it dislodged? Is there, are they sick because, you know, they came into contact with an STD? So we use um, pains and that would be period late. Um, maybe the IUD got dislodged and uh, they may be pregnant. Um, abdominal pain, um, anytime there's abdominal pain, there could be a complication with IUD or it could be um, infection or pregnancy, infection exposure. If they've had, um, if they've had um, intercourse with someone and that someone um, has exposed them to an STD, it can cause um, major inflammation because it decreases the endometrial lining. So when that happens, there's a little bit of inflammation on the endometrial lining, and then that STD can be much worse than it would have been if there was not an IUD in place. Um, not feeling well, you just feel sick, and that could be that you have an infection there. And then strings missing. Remember I told you um, the strings wrap around the cervix, and so every month after your menses, we tell you to check for your strings to make sure they're still there. Emergency contraception. So emergency contraception, people um, have some misconceptions about this one. Um, this is really birth control pills that we give you after a sexual event that stimulates a period. Um, 
it is hormonal um, types we give we well we don't give it you buy it over the counter we used to prescribe and it would be three to five birth control pills and all it did was induce a period so emergency and, and it also if there is a fertilized ovum and it's implanted it is not an abortifactant it will not cause an abortion so um, hormonal given within 72 hours of intercourse in, in order to alter the hormones um, with a negative pregnancy test so we always tell people to take a pregnancy test before they do emergency contraception um, because we don't want any problems with a previously established pregnancy um, and if the pregnancy test is negative, um, this will just induce a period. Um, either a high dose of estrogen progesterone to give in to, uh, given to alter the hormones, the cervical mucus, and the endometrial lining. Um, usually they'll have a period um, soon after they have this, um, and they call this plan B as well, um, after they have this emergency contraception. Um, but a lot of times um, they'll spot a lot for the next month or so because their hormones are all out of whack. And um, you can have some crying and some emotional issues as well. Um, when someone talks about that they've taken Plan B, um, we really strongly encourage them to get on routine birth control. We don't want them to use Plan B um, as a method for birth control. Um, these are high levels of estrogen and progesterone that are given at one time. And of course, they run the risk for, um, you know, for having a clot. So we say, you know, if you had this emergency contraception we'd really like for you to get on a formal plan um, of birth control um, long-acting reversible uh, contraception is the method of choice which would be an IUD we've seen pregnancy rates go down dramatically with that dramatically with that and we love these and then Implanon or Nexplanon is the name of it this is like you can see it's a little it's a little tube um, that is surgically inserted in your arm and I can I'm palpating it right now it's not very long very small it's about this long and it is embedded with progesterone and it gives you five years worth of protection so with the use of long-acting um, long-acting um, reversible contraception the IUD and the next one on the implant in the arm we've seen the use of emergency contraception go down dramatically which we're really happy about we don't we would rather people not use that um, also a form of emergency contraception is an IUD um, it can be placed within seven days of the unprotected event um, we know implantation occurs um, anywhere from six to ten days and we know that this will alter um, the bed of the lining of the uterus and it is used um, as emergency contraception as well so you would use aches for um, if you they took plan B or emergency contraception that would contain estrogen and progesterone and then of course you would educate them with pains if it was an IUD um, for lies uh, female sterilization or tubal ligation this is permanent um, you guys they go in and they cut the tubes I mean it's just as easy as that it's a surgical procedure the tubes are cut um, this we tell people this is permanent we have a lot of people say oh I want to get my tubes reconnected well now you have scar tissue here and we put these back together um, there's only a 50% rate of fertilization after a reversal and then you run a high risk of an ectopic pregnancy because there's no cilia there's no transport at this junction even though it's joined um, we have a lot of scar tissue there so um, really important to emphasize to patients that this is a permanent um, permanent form of contraception um, vasectomy males vasectomy vas deferens they're cut um, and then what's interesting about this is um, the sperm cannot get out during ejaculation the ejaculation is the same there's just no sperm release and as time goes on um, men develop anti-sperm antibodies so you guys after a certain amount of time these anti-sperm antibodies will actually kill the sperm so they won't have even sperm available even if they're even if they wanted to get someone pregnant or have sperm aspirated from their testes they have so many anti-sperm antibodies um, that a lot of times it doesn't work okay that's it for contraception thank you